welcome. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. We're continuing on chapter 15, I think. So uh, we'll pick up from where we left off last time. And again, a reminder, if you do have questions, feel free to type them in as we're going along and I will try to answer those for you. <clears throat> Let's give her a bad minute to get in. So again, uh, we'll be picking up here in chapter 15. So I think this is about where we left off last time. And we'll continue on talking about solutions. All right, so why don't, we, uh, why don't we get started and get going here. So uh, in this chapter, remember, uh, we were talking about solutions, and a solution really has two parts, as we talked about last time as well. It's the solute, which is the smaller part of the solution. So we have, uh, whoops, no. Going back. So we have, uh, let's see here, we have the solute which is the smaller part of the solution. And that usually is, for example, uh, like sodium chloride, for example, something that you oftentimes will take and dissolve in the larger part of the solution, uh, which again is the solvent. And both of those things together, the solute and the solvent is basically what makes up a solution. And remember the solution are the guys that get the aqueous symbol next to it. Um, <clears throat> so when we take something like solid sodium chloride and mix it in something like water, the sodium chloride will dissolve, it will make a solution, and that solution will get the AQ symbol. And as we talked about a couple of times previously, again, the difference between that is and something that has the L symbol, which is just a pure liquid would be something that is like water by itself. Nothing else mixed in there, just kind of by itself uh, would get the liquid and not the aqueous symbol. We talked about as well the idea of uh, sort of solubility and how things basically can mix together and things mix together really based on what we talked about in the chapter before this. Uh, they really work together with those intermolecular forces. And it's really these intermolecular forces that allow, for example, the solute and the solvent to work together uh, to make a solution and be soluble in each other. And if you remember, we talked about the idea of like dissolves like. And again, what that means is essentially things that have similar intermolecular forces so those are things like dipole-dipole interactions, uh, hydrogen bonding, uh, dispersion forces, things that have similar intermolecular forces. They're able to interact with each other through those intermolecular forces really well. And it's the basic interaction, as we talked about, of really opposites attract, the electrostatic attraction, the positive and negative attraction that allows them really to come together. 
And what that relates to in terms of solubility is when we have something that is like dissolves like, what that usually means is if we have something that's ionic, it is soluble in something that is polar. And again, they're able to interact with each other through that interaction of opposites attract. Again, if this is our ion, which would be our ionic guy, and this is our polar molecule, remember if it's polar, it has a positive side and a negative side. And obviously the ions are either going to be positive if they're a cation, or they'll be negative if they're an anion. So they're able to interact with opposite sides there and dissolve. And that's essentially what happens when you do take something that's an ionic compound, like sodium chloride, and you put it in something like water. So if you have the chloride ions that are floating around, which are negatively charged, they again would be attracted, like we saw last time, to the positive side of water, which is the hydrogen end. And again, that's basically what allows them to interact with each other. That is, as we saw as well last time, how basically a solid will dissolve in water. It's able to basically, uh, the ions get surrounded by water through the positive side of water in one case and the negative side of water, which is the oxygen in the other case. And that allows something like sodium chloride to dissolve completely. And it just looks like it disappeared, but it ultimately is there. It is just, you know, in the water network. Um, it also means that if you have something like a polar guy, a polar molecule or something that interacts with another polar molecule, they're also gonna be soluble in each other because both of those guys, because they are polar, will essentially for the most part use dipole-dipole interaction. So they're able to do that positive negative interaction also part of that which again falls under the big kind of class of dipole dipole along with that is our like hydrogen bonding that goes with it which is another type of dipole dipole interaction that occurs but because they both have that sort of positive negative again interaction they're able to mix really well with each other and uh, be soluble in each other so we also have a way for things that are uh, nonpolar as well to interact with each other. And that's why also nonpolar and nonpolar will also interact well with each other. And that means if you have two sort of nonpolar uh, molecules that are going to come in and interact with each other, they also will be soluble in each other. So. Um, and again, in that case, our two nonpolar guys remember they're going to use really dispersion forces, right? And that's the major intermolecular sort of force that works with two nonpolar guys. Those are those weak forces which uh, they temporarily also gain a positive and negative sort of attraction that allows them to interact with each other. So uh, that idea of like dissolves like, polar and polar things are good, they'll be soluble. Nonpolar and nonpolar things will be soluble in each other. Ionic things and polar things will be soluble in each other. But you really only run into some problems really when you cross over with nonpolar and polar are not gonna be soluble in each other. Again, because our nonpolar guy is going to really be trying to use dispersion forces as its only sort of way to interact, while our polar guy would use some type of dipole-dipole, which could include hydrogen bonding as well. And again, as we talked about last time, over the long period of time, they don't have a way to maintain that interaction and they're not really able to do so. Also why if you take something that's ionic and something that's nonpolar, it also will be insoluble as well in each other. So if you take an ionic guy and something that's nonpolar, also going to be insoluble in each other for the same reason our ionic guy is essentially gonna be using something like a dipole-dipole, it's really an ion dipole, 
and our nonpolar guys can do dispersion. So it's for the same reason as our nonpolar and polar. They're not going to have a way for the long period of time to be able to interact with each other. Now, we also talked about solutions in the sense of uh, ways to sort of classify solutions. Uh, so we can have an unsaturated solution. And in an unsaturated solution, what that essentially means is we have not reached a point where our solid will stop dissolving. So in an unsaturated solution, if you put more solid or solute in there to dissolve in the solvent, it will continue to dissolve. And it will continue to dissolve really until it hits a certain point, which is known as the saturation point. And at the saturation point, that is when we get a saturated solution. And what a saturated solution is, is a solution that pretty much at that particular temperature, because solubility is based on temperature, at that particular temperature, you have hit the maximum amount of solute that will dissolve at that given temperature. Um, so um, we have an unsaturated solution, solid will continue to dissolve. It will continue to dissolve all the way up until you hit a saturated solution. At a saturated solution, it will no longer dissolve. It'll just start to sort of pile uh, on, the, on the bottom. The last type of solution I think we finished on are talking about is a supersaturated solution. And in a supersaturated solution, that is one typically where, uh, again, one way that you make it, um, and you'll see the video later today, one way you make it, again, as we talked about last time, is you can make a uh, saturated solution where you increase the temperature and when you increase the temperature, that allows more solute to dissolve. But then when you may perhaps cool it back down, as it starts to cool back down, technically the solubility of what you have dissolved in there is now way too much for it to be dissolved. And it will still look dissolved, it'll still look like a solution as it's cooling down, but it becomes in a lot of cases a sort of unstable solution that you know is so unstable that in certain cases, if you just kind of knock it or something like that, all of the solid will decide, whoa, I should not be dissolved. It'll come out of solution and stuff like that. So in a supersaturated solution, you typically will end up with a solution that has way too much solute dissolved in it uh, at that particular temperature. It's still a solution, but it's very unstable because of that, because it realizes at some point, I have way too much dissolved in here and it shouldn't be that way. And typically what will happen in those sort of unstable solutions, as you'll see later, is it will basically go and be go from a sort of solution uh, to a solid because at some point there is this little tipping point where that solution decides I no longer can be a solution because I have way too much solute dissolved at, in this particular point. Any questions on that? And I think we also finished up on this slide. Uh, other ways to talk about um, solutions. You could have a very concentrated solution. And as I wrote up last time here, and we'll talk about in just a second as well in this lecture, uh, molarity, which is big M, is a way that we sort of uh, represent concentration. And um, if it's a very concentrated solution, that means it has a large amount of solute dissolved. Um, and a lot of times what we do use in lab, and we have in the past, is uh, more dilute solutions. So we take this more concentrated solution and we basically add more solvent and it becomes less concentrated. So I think I did the example of if you get a sort of a uh, beverage there with ice and it tastes really good when you start drinking it. But then again, if you leave that beverage and you don't finish and you come back a couple hours later, all the ice has melted and all that water from the ice has now diluted your soda and you go taste it, it does not taste as good and, and strong as it originally did. It tastes more watered down. And that's essentially what a, a dilute solution is from its concentrated solution, it's sort of a more watered down version, if you will. It has a little less amount of solute per solvent, basically, in that solution, and it has a lower concentration. Any questions on any of that stuff that I think we talked about last time? And again, a reminder, if you do have questions, feel free to type them, even if I have passed the page where your question is, you know, I'll go back and make sure I, I answer it and stuff like that. So uh, we're gonna pick up, I think, from this point here.
and we should be getting into some calculations now in terms of concentration. So let's take a look at that. The first sort of concentration unit that we're going to talk about is one that is referred to as mass mass percent or sometimes just mass percent. Um, <clears throat> So sometimes this guy will be abbreviated with sort of this symbol here, percent M slash M. And that really means mass to mass percent is what we're really looking at. So to calculate the mass to mass percent as we see on this picture here is it's the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100%. So we want to take the mass of the solute, which is the smaller part of the solution. We want to divide it by the mass of the solution and times it by 100%. Now the key part when you do this calculation and where a lot of people will sort of mess up on this calculation is this bottom part here. So it's important to remember that the mass of the solution is made up of two things. It is the solute and the solvent. And very common in sort of mass, mass percent problems, they'll give you that information separate from each other. So uh, they'll tell you the mass of the solute separate from the mass of the solvent. And it's very common that people will just sort of use the mass of the solvent by itself and not use the, the mass of the actual solution. So they'll just use the solvent and not the solution. Uh, so usually a lot of times in these cases, we'll have to uh, basically uh, add those parts together. So you want to make sure that you do that. In addition, you can also sometimes be given the percent mass mass of a solution. So for example, if we were told that we had a, a 4.50% mass to mass solution of sodium chloride, you can actually kind of turn that into a conversion factor to be used in problems. And basically what that means is when we do have a percentage, we usually assume 100 because that keeps the numbers all the same. So what that essentially would mean is you would have 4.50 grams of sodium chloride in 100 grams of solution. And because you can use it as a conversion factor, you could also do the opposite approach. 100 grams of solution gives you 4.50 grams of sodium chloride. So sometimes you may be given the percentage in the problem and you could plug and chug it into uh, this equation up here. Or you could do more of a dimensional analysis approach and kind of turn that percentage into a conversion factor and sort of solve the problem that way. So there are a couple of different ways you can sort of solve these problems. Mathematically speaking, they're really the same math. It's just sort of how you set it up, um, but you can sort of turn a percentage into that. And these are grams over grams. Obviously when we do, uh, this is uh, grams divided by grams here. So when we do grams divided by grams, those cancel. And you're really left with a unit of percent. And if it's mass to mass, usually you'd write M slash M sort of next to it. So when you do calculate the percent mass to mass, there's really no units other than the percentage. And like I said, usually M slash M is, is what you would add to it. So let's take a look here. I think that one. So why don't you take a, a minute or two here and calculate this. We're looking for the percent mass to mass of this. So why don't you calculate the percent mass to mass. Take a minute or two and then we'll talk about it.
Okay, let's take a look at this. So again, here, uh, we're looking to calculate the percent mass to mass. So a reminder that that is the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100%. So here we're taking a solution that's made by mixing 2.5 grams of calcium chloride with 50 grams of water. So just so we're clear, our solute in this case is the smaller amount. So that is actually our calcium chloride. So 2.50 grams of calcium chloride, which is not that. Let's try that again. It's a good thing they made erasers, right? Let's try that. All right, let's try to write first and then think. Here we go, the calcium chloride. So again, this is our solute. Again, this is a smaller part of the solution. While in this particular case, water would be our solvent. So the mass of the solvent is 50 grams here of water. And these two work really well together. Again, as we were talking about calcium, I want to put that L first, calcium chloride, which is ionic is going to work well with water, which is polar. Again, they're going to be able to do some of that dipole, really dipole interaction. So they're going to mix really well together, and they will be soluble in each other. The important part, though, is remember that we do have the mass of the solute here, but we do not have the mass of the solution. This, again, is just the solvent. So to get the mass of the solution, we need to take the mass of the solute plus the mass of the solvent, which in this case is 2.50 grams plus 50 grams. And that's going to give you uh, 52.5 grams when we add that together. So when we take our percentage we want to take our solute, which is 2.5 grams, divided by, again, not just the solvent, but the solution, which is our 52.5. We want to divide it by 100, and we will get about 4.76%. So you'll get something like 4.76%, which would be the unit since we're looking back. Again, like I said, most people put a little parentheses to the M slash N to indicate it's mass to mass percent. And if you like, you can put the sodium. This is not sodium chloride. I got that in my head. Calcium chloride next to it. A lot of eraser today. There we go. Get rid of that there. there we go. And this would be calcium chloride here. Any questions on this calculation? So again, like I said, this part right here is where a lot of people will make a mistake. They will just use the 50, uh, which is the solvent by itself. You got to make sure that you do get the solution. And very common in these type of problems, it's sort of separate from each other. They give you that information separate, both the solute and the solvent. Any questions on that there? I think you have another one, so why don't you give this one a go here. Concentrated hydrochloric acid solution contains 37.2% by mass. What is the mass of HCl contained in 35.5 grams of the HCl? This would be your HCl solution. All right, take a minute or two to do that. While I look at your question, Grace, and uh, let me just go back and take a look. Yeah, so if you look at that last question, uh, pretty much everything, there it is. Uh, where was that last one? There it is. Everything in that last question essentially was uh, three significant figures, including when we added here as well. So when we did our dividing here, three sig figs. So at the end there, we ended up with three significant figures because of that. All right, so take a minute or two and. Uh, 
come up with that answer. So you're welcome. Okay, so uh, in this case, we're actually given the uh, mass to mass percent. So again, we could still be using the, the same formula here, which is our percent mass to mass is our mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100%. So in this case, if we look at a couple of things, we are given the percent mass to mass in this problem, uh, which is 37.2% uh, HCl. We want to know, we want to know what is the uh, grams of HCl, which is the mass, right, of HCl. And we have really the mass of the solution given to us, which is 35.5 grams of HCl. Now, when we have an HCl solution, which is basically this, remember, as we talked about last time, how you know what is the solute, what is the solvent. Again, the solute is going to be pretty much the name of the solution which means since this is a hydrochloric acid solution, hydrochloric acid would be our solute. And because it is an aqueous solution, probably the water here is going to be our solvent. So again, if you had a calcium chloride solution like we had in the previous problem, that's how we know that that is the solute, is the name of it. That's also how we know in this case that what we're actually looking for is the mass of the solute because we're looking for 
the grams of HCl, which is the name of the solution. And that's also how we can determine that the mass of the solution is that 35.5 gram number. So that's how we could kind of tell that the 35.5 gram number is actually the solution <clears throat> uh, and not the solute again, because the solute would be pretty much the name of the solution. Now you can solve this two ways. You can plug and chug into that top equation because essentially uh, you obviously have this number, you have this number, you can go and solve for the top one. You could also do it as a uh, dimensional analysis conversion problem. So I'm gonna do it that way just to show you how that one would look. Again, from the 37.2% HCl, that basically means that we have 37.2 grams of HCl and a hundred grams of solution. R, we could write another conversion factor where we have 100 grams of solution is our 37.2 grams of HCl. Now, since we already have the mass of the solution, which is our 35.5 grams of solution, we are going to use the conversion factor over here. And we can just do it like a conversion problem a dimensional analysis. Or you can plug and chug it into the top equation. The grams of solution will cancel, and that will leave us the grams of HCl, which in this case looks like it will be 13.2 grams of HCl. Now that's the exact same math you would do if you plugged in to the formula, because if you solve for the mass of the solute, it would equal the percent mass to mass times the mass of the solution divided by 100%. And that's essentially what we did here in this calculation over here and what you would do over here. Mathematically, they're exactly the same. If you just rearrange the equation and plopped it in there, all the numbers, you would get basically 35.5 times 37.2 divided by 100. Um, or if, again, if you want to do it more like a conversion factor because they gave you the percentage, uh, you could do it that way. They both give you, as you can see here, the exact same um, basically answer. Any questions on that? Now, this is one common sort of percentage uh, concentration that's used. There are a couple of others, so let's just talk about the others. And they work pretty much identical to these. Uh, they're just a little bit different in terms of what they sort of mean. So mass to mass percent uh, is our mass of our solute like we've been doing. over the mass of the solution times 100%. There's also volume to volume percent, or percent volume to volume percent, and that is the volume of solute divided by the volume of solution times 100%. Now, this is sort of like, you know, percent alcohol by volume and stuff like that. That's basically what, you know, kind of what the percent volume to volume is. It's the same deal. The only difference is how gram, uh, mass to mass is basically grams divided by grams. Here it is milliliters divided by milliliters usually, or liters over liters. But a lot of times it's milliliters over milliliters. The other nice thing about the volume to volume one is usually in problems, they just give you the volume of the solution so you don't have to worry about the solute and the solvent and sort of adding them together. Um, but that's another very common way type of percentage. And the last one is percent mass to volume. It's another sort of percentage concentration and that's the mass of the solute divided by the volume of solution times 100%. This one is kind of like grams divided by milliliters usually. Although the units, we really just call it percentage at the end. 
Um, it's kind of like density almost. Um, so those are the three common sort of percentage uh, units. And you can basically kind of do the calculation the same for all of them. They work the same way. So for example, just to run through all three of them here with a percentage, if I had, like I had before, the 4.50% by mass sodium chloride, again, what that means is we have our 4.5 grams of sodium chloride and 100 grams of solution. Or again, you could do the opposite like we've been doing. Grams of solution, 4.50 grams of sodium chloride. If I had a 4.50% mass to volume sodium chloride, that would mean the same idea. You would have 4.50 grams of sodium chloride. And since it's volume though, it would be usually 100 milliliters of solution or in a 100 milliliters of solution, you have 4.50 grams sodium chloride. So it works the same way. You could kind of do it as a conversion factor as well. And lastly, if you had a 4.50% volume to volume sodium chloride, that would mean you would have 4.50 milliliters, that's a bad milliliter, of sodium chloride over 100 milliliters of solution or in 100 milliliters of solution you would have your 4.50 milliliters of sodium chloride. So they all kind of work the same in terms of the math of the problem. It's just sort of different units depending on if you're doing percent mass to mass, which would be grams and grams. Percent mass to volume would be grams and milliliters usually. And percent volume to volume is usually milliliters and milliliters. Again, the volumes could change, but a lot of times when we sort of measure things out or do things, we use milliliters a lot. So usually milliliters is what you associate with it. Any questions on any of the percent concentrations? Again, the calculations are very similar to the ones we just did with percent mass to mass. Any other questions or anything like that? Yeah, if you do get disconnected, just come back and log back in. Um, you know, the last week there was having some issues with uh, with sort of the meetings and stuff like that, but so far not too many people I'm seeing getting kicked out and coming back or anything like that. At least on my end, I don't see it. All right, any questions on any of that type of stuff? Okay. All right. Uh, so then let's talk really about sort of the most commonly used uh, unit of uh, concentration, and that is molarity. And molarity is what is abbreviated with the big M. So big M stands for molarity. And I would say probably out of all the sort of concentration units, including the three that we just talked about, molarity is really the one that you come across probably 99% of the time in terms of chemistry. Um, so molarity, which is uh, basically the big M, technically is moles of solute divided by liters of solution. Although most of the time people just say molarity is moles over liters, sort of understood that that is the solute. You could kind of treat this like a formula. Um, you can solve for any of those things. So if we wanted to solve for liters, liters would be moles divided by the molarity. If we wanted to solve for moles, which is a very common calculation, it is liters times molarity. So those are sort of three ways that you could kind of rearrange it. Uh, again, molarity is, uh, is moles per liter. Uh, so when you do calculate the uh, molarity, it does have to be liters on the bottom, moles on the top. And again, a couple different ways or calculations you sometimes have to do with molarity. Uh, if you have grams, you need to convert them to moles. So as we've done many times at this point, hopefully, if you have grams to go to moles, you oftentimes have to use the periodic table and molar mass to get it into the moles. And then common conversion, 
the thousand milliliters is a liter. So that's something that you use a lot uh, to kind of convert between milliliters and liters and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> now, if we do have something, continuing with our sodium chloride sort of example, if I had 4.50 big M sodium chloride, what that would, the way you would say that is that's 4.5 molar is how you would say uh, sodium chloride. And sometimes people want to keep the big M when they do calculations. And I would highly recommend not doing that uh, because a lot of times what happens is people see the M and they only in their head think this part, moles. And they forget all about sort of the leaders part of it. They're not really sure where their leaders are. Did they cancel? Did they not cancel? So if you have something that is 4.5 molar sodium chloride, essentially you could change that into 4.50 moles per liter of sodium chloride. And the moles, the number always stays with the moles part, and it's always one liter when you do molarity. So when you do molarity and you convert it from the big M, which is moles per liter. That's essentially how you convert it. You could also use molarity as a conversion factor if you want to do it like dimensional analysis. You could put the liters on top, the 4.5 moles on the bottom, and you could use it like a conversion factor. But this arrangement here is basically what that big M stands for. And I would highly recommend that you do convert it out into this because now you could clearly see the moles, you could clearly see the liters, you hopefully won't lose anything along the way in the calculation, and that's a very common sort of place where people mess up on. So if we have something that is 4.5, uh, one molar sodium chloride, for example, that means we have basically one molar sodium chloride, which we have one mole of solid sodium chloride in enough water, for example, to make a final volume of one liter. That also would mean that we have one mole of sodium ions in one uh, liter. So how molarity works in terms and concentration works when we have an ionic compound, when we have something like sodium chloride and it breaks apart, it does break apart into sodium ions and chloride ions. And if, for example, this guy was one molar, the whole thing, we could kind of treat it like stoichiometry. For every one of these guys, we get one sodium ion, and its concentration then would be one times one, which means the molarity of just the sodium ions would be one molar. And if we look at the sodium chloride to the chloride ion, it also is a one-to-one -one relationship, which means one times one would give us one molar in terms of the chloride ion. Concentration of the ions aren't additive, and obviously, yeah, molarity is capital M, and that's actually, it is actually capital M uh, when you do it. So this right here, which is what we're talking about now is molarity. And you do want to make sure that you do capitalize it because although we don't talk about it in this class, in another class, if you have a lowercase m, it's actually another type of concentration unit which is known as molality. So it actually is something different. So it, molarity does need to be capitalized uh, because actually if you don't capitalize it, it's actually another type of concentration unit. Uh, which we actually don't talk about in here. But when you take 1A, uh, you will talk about it. So there is a difference. And also in our class, the little m a lot of times will be mass. So you want to make sure you do capitalize the molarity. Now, how it works, though, if we say had something like <clears throat> calcium chloride. I don't know why today I can't. I want to put that L first. I have an issue with that. Let's try that again. Maybe I'll get it before today's over. Here we go. All right, so if we got uh, calcium chloride here with the C first. <clears throat> when that's in solution, it breaks apart into a calcium ion and two chloride ions. 
So how concentration worked, again, if we started with one molar of the entire thing together, when it breaks apart, it's a one-to-one -one relationship for calcium. So again, that would be one times one molar, which would give us one molar for our calcium ions. But in this particular case, it is one-to-two relationship in terms of how it breaks apart. What that essentially means is in this solution, you have twice as many chloride ions floating around as you do calcium ions. You could say it's twice as concentrated. So how the concentration is affected is you actually multiply it by two. So two times 1.0 molar gives us two molar would be the concentration of the chloride ions in this case. So sometimes you may be asked for a question where they're asking you about the molarity of not the whole thing together, but actually one of the ions by itself. And you could kind of do like a stoichiometry relationship uh, between them as to how the concentration changes. So if it's a one-to-one -one relationship between the whole thing and that ion, the concentration will be the same. The molarity will be the same. If it's a one-to-two relationship like it is with the chloride in the second example, you basically need to multiply the concentration of the whole thing by two. If it breaks apart into a one to three relationship, you would multiply it by three. And really the reason why that works is what I just showed you is essentially the quick way of doing the calculation. The long way just to show you how we get there is if I started with one molar calcium chloride, per liter. Again, from the formula, we see that for every one mole of the whole thing, and again, I did it again. I don't know if I was there. Try that again. One mole of the whole thing, we get two moles of the chloride. The moles of the whole thing cancel, and that's how we get to two moles of the chloride per liter. So, the essential thing is you just need to multiply by two basically because it breaks apart into a two. All right, so let's take a look at some of these here. I'm gonna try not to write the calcium chloride again today because I keep messing it up. So why don't you give this a go? Uh, why don't you calculate the molarity of a solution that's made by dissolving 15.6 grams of KBR in 1.25 liters uh, to make 1.25 liters of solution from the periodic table, potassium is 39.10. And bromine here is 79.90. We're looking for the molarity here. So we're looking for the big M. So take a moment and calculate it, see how you do.
Okay, so we're looking for the molarity. So a reminder that in this case, uh, the molarity again is our moles of solute over liters of solution. In this case, uh, just so we're clear, the KBR is our solute. The water in this case is our solvent. Again, they work good together because this is ionic. This is polar. So they're going to work really well together. So uh, we do have the volume of solution here given to us, but we are missing the moles part. So our solute though is given to us in grams. So we do need to convert those grams, KBR, into moles. In order to do that, we will need the molar mass of KBR, which again, you could get from the periodic table. And in this case, we just need to add them together, one of each. And it looks like we end up with 119 grams per mole would be our molar mass from our periodic table uh, when we add those guys together. You do not need to, uh, uh, on the test, <clears throat> you do not need to on the test write out if they are polar ionic, unless they ask you, I suppose, uh, if it's polar ionic. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'll go back a slide in just a second uh, to the previous one, as soon as we're done with this one. Um, when we uh, have that molar mass, we're going to use that again as a conversion factor to uh, convert. So our 119 grams of KBR would go on the bottom so that the grams cancel. That's going to leave us uh, moles up on top. Our grams will cancel and we will end up with 15.6 divided by 119. And that's going to get us uh, 0.131 moles of KBR. And again, that is what we needed for the top. So to find the molarity, we would take our 0 0.131 moles over our liters that was given to us in liters. And when we divide them, we will get 0 0.105. Now in terms of units, 0 0.105, you can write it one of two ways. So the units don't cancel. So again, the number would stay with the moles and it would be per one liter. And you could write uh, KBR here. Or another way that you could write the answer would be 0 0.105. And instead of that, just put the big M KBR. So again, in terms of the answer, you can leave it either way. They're both perfectly fine in terms of that. Any questions on where any of the numbers came from or anything like that? Again, another common variation here would be if the solution was given to you in milliliters, you would then have to convert again the milliliters into liters uh, before you put it into the molarity. Any questions on that one there? All right. So there's that calcium chloride, I think, was the one we're looking for. Yeah, what's your question? Go for it. Why we let uh, somebody look at this one here? Calcium chloride, no. one more maybe, there it is. Yeah, so if you're talking about molarity, uh, molarity again is moles per liter. So it's really important in terms of when you're calculating the molarity, uh, specifically the moles per liter part, um, you wanna make sure that the volume is in liters. And the reason why that's important again is because uh, if you don't have it in, in liters, you'll be off obviously by a factor of a thousand. And the reason why you have to convert it to liters is a lot of times in problems, and in life, when we measure things in the laboratory, for example, when we were actually in the laboratory, uh, if you remember, a lot of stuff that we deal with in terms of volumes are in milliliters. 
So a lot of times when you come across volumes and problems are sort of in the lab, they oftentimes are uh, in milliliters. So you do have to convert that into liters before you go into the molarity. Uh, but molarity is always moles over liters, and it should always be the liters on the bottom. Let's go back to the one we were just doing. There we go. There we go. Any other questions about that there? And I'll put it back up in just one second. I just want to see. We do have another problem. So while uh, others are looking at the previous one, why don't you give this one a go here and we'll We'll give it a try. We're looking for the concentration of each of the ions in this in each of those solutions. I put this other one back up for just a second. All right, so everybody should be working on this. Again, uh, we're looking for the concentration, the molarity of each of the ions in each of those solutions. So they're two separate solutions. They're not mixed together, just two separate solutions. What is the sodium concentration in the first one and the sulfate? What's the potassium concentration and the chromate concentration in the second one?
Okay, so let's take a look at this. This is sort of what we were talking about when we just started talking about uh, molarity a few slides ago. When you have this, the molarity of the entire thing, and you're interested in perhaps not the whole thing, but just the individual ions, you want to think about how this breaks apart. So this is going to break apart into two sodium ions and one sulfate ion again from the two here and then obviously this is a one here and as we talked about before if you know the concentration of the whole thing together you can basically treat it like stoichiometry so this is a one to two relationship in terms of how it breaks apart so it's twice as concentrated in terms of the sodium so the concentration of the sodium ions would be two times the 1.20 the two for here and that would get you something like 2.40 molar sodium ions in this particular case. We could do the same thing for the sulfate. For every one of the whole thing, we get one of just the sulfate. So it's basically a one-to-one -one relationship, which means you would multiply it by one technically, and the molarity actually doesn't change. It's the same. So the molarity for the sulfate part would be 1.2 molar. Any questions on that one? Do the same thing for our second guy. Again, is going to break apart. And when this breaks apart, we get two potassium ions plus a chromate. And same idea here. It's a, the whole thing is 0.75 molar. It's a one to two relationship for our potassium. So the concentration would be two times 0.75 molar. And what that would get you is for the potassium, 1.50 in terms of the molarity. For just the potassium ions, again, it's twice as concentrated in terms of the potassium. And then it's a one, to one relationship between the chromate and that would get us one times 0 0.75 molar and that would get us 0 0.75 molar for our chromate. Any questions on that? And to answer your question, no, this chapter is not on the exam on Wednesday. No. This will be on our, I guess our fourth exam, I guess it would be at that point. And also remember chapter 14 will not be on there either. So again, we'll talk about the exam in just a second, but um, we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, what will be on and everything. Okay, go ahead, type your question. So again, sometimes you're not interested in, in obviously the entire thing, you're just interested in the ion. Um, yeah, so uh, if your question is, uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> in the first one, you had basically a, a solution that was 1.2 molar sodium sulfate. And that would be the final concentration of the whole thing with everything together. And on um, the second one, you had basically 0 0.75 molar uh, potassium chromate. Um, and that would be the whole solution's concentration. But remember within this particular solution, for example, yeah, all the M's are capital M's, they're molarity, so they should be capital M. Um, so in this solution, remember that for every one of those guys, you get basically two sodium ions floating around for one sulfate ion. So that's why when we look at it here uh, and we look at the concentration in this solution of just the sodium, it's basically twice as concentrated because there's two of those for every one of the sulfate ions that are floating around. And so that's how sort of the molarity relationship works from the whole thing even though in technically speaking, the whole solution itself together, the sodium sulfate together has a concentration of 1.2 molar, obviously is not additive. So if you add 2.4 plus 1.2, you 
you don't get 1.2. So concentration doesn't work that way. It's not sort of additive in terms of adding up all the ions will give you the overall concentration. It's just sort of a relationship in terms of in the solution, you know, sort of how concentrated it is in this for this ion and how concentrated it is for the other ion. So um, sometimes people are confused by that. They're like, but if you kind of add these together, you're at like whatever that is, 3.6 molar, right? And you're telling me the whole concentration is only 1.2 molar. So um, again, concentration doesn't work that way. It's not additive in terms of the ions. It's more you could think about it sort of like a proportion. Like when you throw something in, you get twice amount, twice as much of this guy than you do of the other guy. And that's sort of how you should think about it. But in terms of the ions, they're not sort of additive in that sense. Other questions? And again, this would, would technically be sort of usually a situation where you have a question where they're not interested, like I said, in, in sort of the, the whole solution together, just more interested in the uh, ion part. So why don't you try one of those? We're looking for here, what, how many moles of sodium ions are present in the 42.0 milliliters of a 3.5 molar sodium chloride solution? So why don't you take a minute or two and calculate that. We're looking for just the moles of the sodium ions present, and we'll talk about it. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Uh, we want how many moles of sodium ions are present in 42.0 milliliters of a 0.35 molar solution. So obviously we're dealing with molarity, so if you're not sure, molarity, again, I apologize, it is big M here, didn't throw a dig, uh, is moles over liters. So we wanna think about a couple of things that we got. Uh, we have some molarity given to us, we don't have liters, but we do have milliliters. So we do need to do that conversion, right? For everything to work out, right? Uh, so <clears throat> we wanna solve for moles eventually, which would be liters times molarity. 
Now, in this case, we're not interested again in the whole thing here. We are just interested in the sodium ion aspect. So again, when something like sodium chloride breaks apart, it is gonna break apart into one sodium ion and one chloride ion. So as we've been talking about in terms of molarity, we know that the whole entire thing here is 0.35 molar. And again, is a one to one relationship in terms of the sodium ion, which means again, for the sodium ion here, it would be one times 0.35 which means the molarity of just the sodium ions would be 0.35 molar. And again here, you can use molarity like a conversion factor where you get rid of the big M. And what that really means is you have 0.35 moles of sodium ion over a liter of solution or you could flip it around and use it like this as a conversion factor with the liters on top. And again, sometimes people like to work these more like a dimensional analysis problem. We have now the molarity. We do need to still convert our volume into liters. So 42 milliliters. There's a thousand milliliters in a liter. You're basically just gonna move the decimal place three places to the left in this case. So now we have the liters, we have the molarity. So if we take 0 0.0420 liters, and again, if I sort of do the problem like dimensional analysis, I will wanna use it like this, 0 0.350 moles of sodium on top per liter liters are going to cancel and we will end up with 0 0.0147 moles. Of sodium ions. Any questions on any of those calculations? And again, like I was talking about earlier, I highly recommend that you uh, get rid of the big M and convert it into moles and liters when you're doing the problem because very, very common people forget all about the, the liters part when they're doing the calculation. They literally have kind of no idea where where it is, is it on top, is it on bottom? So if you sort of do these problems almost dimensional analysis way, you can really keep track of both of those units, the moles and the liters. Any questions on any of those there? All right, so why don't you try the next one? Uh, we'll finish up here on this last problem that we got going on, which I think you're looking for some grams of sodium nitrate. Let's see what you come up with. So what is the mass in grams of sodium nitrate to make 2.5 liters of a 0.15 molar solution? I'm gonna give you some numbers from the periodic table. Sodium is 2299 grams per mole. Nitrogen is 1401 grams per mole. And oxygen is 16 grams per mole. All right, so take a couple of minutes here. We'll finish up on this calculation. We'll talk about it.
All right, so since we're getting to the end here, let's take a look. So obviously we're dealing again with molarity, um, which is our moles per liter. So if you're not sure where to start in this case, let's just think about what they gave us. They gave us the liters of solution, which is good. So we have the liters. They also gave us the molarity in this case. So again, it would make sense probably to solve for moles. And that also does make sense because from moles, we could go to grams using our molar mass in this case. So again, you could kind of sort of think about molarity as a formula, think about what they gave you as to what would be the logical sort of step to do that. So again, if we do solve for moles, that is going to be liters times molarity, which is a very common sort of conversion to do so. Remember, again, when they give you 0.15 molar sodium nitrate, I would highly recommend, like I've been talking about, to get rid of the big M and convert that into 0.15 moles of sodium nitrate per liter. That way, again, you can see both units, the moles and the liters. You can sort of use it as a conversion factor. So we're going to start with our moles will equal our liters, which in this case is 2.50. Again, if it was not in liters, you would have to convert it to liters if it was a milliliter. We're going to use our molarity like a conversion factor. And we actually could use it just like it's written there, 0.150 moles of sodium nitrate per liter. Liters are going to cancel. In this particular case, unlike the previous one, we're interested in the whole thing, the sodium nitrate, so we don't have to worry about how does it break apart or anything like that. We could just keep it together since we're not interested in one ion versus the other, so we're interested in the whole thing. So we're going to take our 2.5, we're going to multiply 0.15. That's going to give us 0.375 moles of the whole thing of our sodium nitrate. Any questions up to that point? Again, that gets us to basically here, which is good. We have one more step to go because in this case, we are not looking for moles, but we are looking for grams. So that is what our periodic table is gonna help us do, our molar mass. So we have one sodium at 2299. We have one nitrogen at 1401. And we have three oxygens at 16 each from the periodic table. And that's going to give us our molar mass. So that's going to be some type of number. Uh, 85 it is, we'll go with 85 grams per mole. So again, we're going to use that as a conversion factor. In this case, moles are on the bottom. So we do want moles on the bottom, our 85 grams on top. Moles are gonna cancel and that will get you about 31.9 grams of sodium nitrate. Any questions on that? So essentially what this means is if you wanted to make the solution, you would take a beaker or something, for example, maybe a graduate cylinder, do a volumetric class. You would dump in there 31.9 grams of sodium nitrate that's solid. You then, because sodium nitrate's ionic, it's going to work well with a good solvent of water. And you would throw in there enough water to basically dissolve this, right? Because they're gonna dissolve because it's ionic and polar, so it's gonna work well together until you have a total volume of 2.5 liters. You give it a good mixy, mixy, shaky, shaky. What you should have after you do that is 2.5 liters of a 0 0.15 molar solution of sodium nitrate. 
So that's essentially what these numbers means. You would scoop out, like we just calculated there, 31.9 grams of sodium nitrate, put enough water in there to get the solid sodium nitrate, for example, to dissolve. Once it dissolves, you would fill it up to a total volume of 2.5 liters, shake it up really well, and you then would have made a solution that has a molarity of 0.15 molar, and you would have obviously 2.5 liters of it. Any questions on that? I'm not sure the solution would look blue, but you get the idea. All right, so that's a good, I think, stopping place uh, for today. That also should allow you to be able to complete today's lab that's scheduled, which should be uh, experiment 20, uh, which is solutions. So part of the lab you're gonna watch, there's a, there's a number of different videos actually for different parts of the experiment. So I think there's one video for part B1, a separate video for B2, uh, a third video for C1 and a fourth video for uh, C2. I also added a video for part A. Uh, that video that I added is, is longer, but actually the first, I think I wrote on there four minutes, 16 seconds, relates to sort of the experiment, uh, sort of demonstration. So you could use just the first four minutes or so of that video to uh, uh, make your observations for part A. Uh, the rest of the video, if you want to watch the rest of it, is kind of the same idea. He just does a couple of different other things that you don't have to make observations on. But really, the first kind of four minutes and 16 seconds of that video is what you could use to make your observations for part A. Now, for part D of the experiment, it is a molarity calculation. You're going to be asked to calculate the molarity of a solution. And in the uh, experiment, it'll give you all the information that you need to calculate it. And you're just going to kind of calculate it and then uh, sort of describe the calculation, you know, how much you need to weigh out and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's pretty much going to be the experiment. The post lab questions will deal with solubility. So you're going to do a lot of like, it's not up yet. It will be up in just a second as soon as we're done. Uh, it will be up there around 12. As soon as we're done here, I'll click the buttons and it'll be up there for you to do in just a second. Um, <clears throat> So uh, a lot of it also deals with what we've been talking about here earlier, the like dissolves like. So remember that polar things, it is going to be due today at, at like five-ish or so, I think. Yeah, so make sure you get it in by five. It will still accept it all the way to the end of the day, but technically it's late. So try to get it in by five on time, yeah. But it still will accept it after five, I think, for the rest of the day. Um, is we're going to look at things like like dissolves like. So if you have something that's polar with polar, should be soluble. If something is uh, nonpolar, nonpolar should be soluble. Ionic and polar should be soluble. Again, as we talked about, if you cross with something that is polar with nonpolar, will be insoluble, and something that's ionic and nonpolar will be insoluble. So you're going to look at those things as well. So you should be able to answer everything, including all the post lab questions. There's a couple of molarity calculations at the end, and you should be able to do all that. Now on Wednesday is our next exam. It's a good thing I'm reminded of that today. So hopefully we'll have that written by Wednesday. Um, again, a reminder that the exam will cover um, not chapter uh, 14. So 14 we took off of this exam. So that should be 13 and some other things. So it should be the gas laws, should be stoichiometry, I think, balancing equations, I wanna say. Uh, so I think that's what, uh, I believe that's what's on the exam. Everything but chapter 14, which will be moved to the next one. I still haven't had an opportunity to change the due date for chapter 14, but I will uh, when I get a chance to do that. But the rest of the assignments will be due when they're supposed to be due. Uh, just like last time, just like last time, we're going to, uh, we'll have just a small lecture uh, during our normal lecture time. We'll stop probably a little bit earlier. And just like last time, the exam will be available for you to take starting uh, you know, during lab time. So again, if you start it during lab time, when lab normally starts, you should have all the time that you would need to complete it. And just like the previous one, you will need to obviously upload your work uh, and show your work on those questions that have work associated with it. So it'll be very much identically done uh, like we did at the last exam. Um, it'll be done through Canvas. And then after you're done with the exam, you submit it once, uh, you'll upload your work. Any questions on any of that stuff? So again, a small lecture on Wednesday. 
we'll stop a little bit early on that. That way, at least we can get through some of the stuff that you'll need for next week's labs. And uh, then you can go free up the time for lab and all that to take it. Again, it'll be open for a window of time like the last one. Make sure that you take it with enough time to get all the time that you should. Again, don't wait till the last 10 minutes because it will cut you off. Any other questions or anything like that? So like normal, uh, we're, we'll take a little break right now. In about 10, 15 minutes, I'll start the lab session in case you have questions. I think for the most part, it should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, and you should be able to work through those labs. Make sure, again, you upload them by today at 5-ish. I think 5 is the cutoff. But again, it will take it after 5, but it will mark it late. So try to get there by 5. All right, so if there's no other questions, I'm going to stop the lecture now. I'm going to go make the labs visible. So give me a couple of minutes, and then they should be visible. And then in about 10, 15 minutes, I'll start the lab session. All right, any other questions? All right, I'll see everybody in a bit or on Wednesday.